Roberta and I was involved with it for many years. I'm glad to see that it turned out so well. So this is changing directions completely. This is, this is dealing with, um, actually, there's, there's a fourth part of this. First is um, what we're going to be doing is, there we go, is discussing um, how, in dealing with transportation related properties, how do we assess eligibility for the National Register? Uh, how do we assess integrity? And how do we assess effects, specifically adverse effects? And how do we apply the Secretary of Interior standards for rehabilitation? So whether we get through all four of those in 45 minutes is gonna be a, a, a challenge, but we'll do the best that we can. You see where this is going? So assessing, okay, now it's something I want, I want to say. Um, there are some observations that I'm going to be making that, that are based upon my having been involved in assessing transportation facilities for 30 years or more. Uh, they're not necessarily based in the in the, the criteria or the regulations, it's just the way it works. Uh, and this, this is the, the, the first point is, generally there are three things that get taken into account in dealing with uh, eligibility for transportation properties. Significance under criterion A in uh, transportation history and significance under criterion C either in architecture or engineering and in rarity. There's nothing in the regulations that say that a transportation property can't be found eligible under criterion B or criterion D. My point is it's never done. It, it, that I was glad to see that, that when you spelled out the, the, the significance of the, of the depot, it was A and C. And that is just what you see. If you go back and look at all the properties that have been listed in the National Register in California, that are transportation related. The vast majority of them will be uh, under criteria A and C. And rarity I'll get to in just a, in, in a minute. The, the, the National Register guidelines, not, not, not the criteria, take into account, acknowledge that rarity can be a factor in assessing significance. I'm, I'm going to make the point that it is particularly useful concept in dealing with transportation property. Okay, criterion A, um, and, and, and this is a general point that the, there is something about having a bridge or having a highway or having a, an airport that is useful. Every one of them is useful. Uh, if, if, we, if we don't exercise any judgment, then everyone is eligible for the National Register. We have to think about what it is that, that uh, goes beyond the ordinary. Uh, in, so I'm gonna be focusing on, in a, in a couple of different areas, this particular bridge is if you walk outside, it's just right there. Um, it is a, a casebook uh, example of a property that is eligible under criterion A. It is on the main line of the Southern Pacific Railroad. It, is, it crosses one of the major barriers that, that the Southern Pacific crosses, encounters in the whole route from, from Oakland to uh, Chicago. And it's been doing that for a long time. And it's also, incidentally, it was at the time that it was built, equally significant in its support of navigation, which was, which was extremely important form of transportation at the time. And, 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 and I'm kind of thinking maybe someday it will be important again the way it was. But it, it, this bridge supported these two different types. And it also happened to carry uh, wagons and, and pedestrians across the, the top deck. It's a, it's a railroad bridge on the bottom deck, and it's a, it's a vehicular bridge on the top deck. 
there we go. Those are the points that I would, would uh, like to make. And this is another one. There's nothing in the criteria, nothing in the guidelines or the published criteria that say that a transportation property can can be cannot be eligible under criterion A without also being eligible under criterion C. But I'm just saying that if you go back and look at all of the properties that have been listed in the National Register, it's, it's hard to track the ones that have been determined eligible, but you could easily track the ones that have been listed. There is no case in California in which a transportation related property, a bridge, a road, uh, was eligible for criterion A without also being eligible on criterion C. The reason being, if you just think about, you know, the, the Golden Gate Bridge or the, or the San Francisco Oakland Bay Bridge, they, they, they so fundamentally transformed the transportation patterns of the Bay Area. But they couldn't have done that without also being really spectacular structures. And the same is true in, in, a, in a much lesser degree uh, with uh, the I Street Bridge. That it, it was, uh, there, are, there are some things, it's, just, it's a really, just a really good looking bridge in my opinion. It's, it's eligible for, for the, the quality of the design. It also happened to have the, the manner in which the center pivot was put together was the first use of a technology that, that subsequently became the, the, the most common way of doing it. So it, it, it was in order to accomplish what, it, 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 in order to accomplish its significance under criterion A, it almost inherently became significant under criterion C as well. And that, that's a very, very common occurrence. So rarity, the, 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 how this, again, this is my opinion, this is my experience, uh, the, the, the rarity is, is in fact recognized in some of the guidelines. It's not recognized in the, in the, directly in the criteria themselves. But if what's peculiar about transportation properties is that there are some, some types of them that are extraordinarily common. Culverts are one. Uh, timber railroad trestles are another. Freeway overcrossings, the thousands of them. Uh, box girder bridges, which is, was a, a, a Caltrans invention. It's, it's, it's a heck of a good bridge. It also happens to be that there are tens of thousands of them around. It, it, it begins to have some um, significance in that it's really hard to find what it is about this concrete box girder bridge versus that concrete box girder bridge that would, would make it significant because there are just so many of them. Uh, culverts uh, are specifically, I, I'm sure that, I'm, I think we have a reasonably savvy group here that Caltrans has a programmatic agreement that kind of uh, governs the way um, highway related projects are treated under section 106. It governs it for Caltrans, but also indirectly because Caltrans plays such a role in local assistance project, ends up governing for local assistance as well. And there are certain types of properties that are so common that they're, they're exempted from evaluation, culverts being one of them. There are others. Can you name all of them? What's that? Okay, good, good, good. And what I, uh, by the way, the, 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 the people who really know what they're talking about are going to be presenting just after lunch. And, and I'm kind of painting uh, the, the edges and they'll fill the details in when, when we get to that. Uh, so count, uh, culverts can be exempted. I would make the case, however, that even with exempted properties like culverts, there's some reason to be, uh, the, you, you need to exercise some judgment, some discretion. The Alvord Lake Bridge in San Francisco, which is the oldest reinforced concrete bridge in the world, it is technically a culvert. 
because it has a main span slightly under 20 feet. And I don't believe that it has a Caltrans number because I think it's treated as if it were, as if it were a culvert. It, it, the thing is a, is a national, is a national historic land, landmark quality resource. I guess I just, this is just a, a point. By the way, I am um, currently writing an, an article about uh, Ernest Ransom who designed this bridge. And I came across, this is, this is stop the presses type information, that when he designed this bridge, he designed two of them. And the other one still exists. And they're, they're identical in almost every respect. The only, the only difference between the two of them is the, with this one, the, uh, they're, they're both, all, all they did was to separate pedestrian uh, traffic from the wagon traffic that went over the top and was, was a pretty busy street up there. And the other one is over by the conservatory, and I call it the conservatory bridge. But uh, the two are identical in every respect, except this one, which leads to the children's playground, has these kind of um, stalactites and stalagmites, you know, the kind of... Uh, um, I think it has to do with the fact that their kids are going to be the ones who use who use this bridge. So, uh, but this is a, a ASCE national landmark, and I'm I, I would make the case that it belongs there. But so does the Conservatory Bridge as well. Hot off the press. This is my own discovery. So, uh, rarity can be used to establish eligibility for otherwise common property types. This, this was a bridge, boy, that is totally out of focus there. Can, is that seem out of focus to you? Yeah. Anyway, this is a bridge, this is a bridge that, this is a bridge that uh, in an otherwise uh, quite reliable Caltrans bridge inventory was found to be not eligible, but uh, upon further review by uh, a bridge historian was found to be represent a an unusual type that had been widely listed in other state bridge surveys but not in California and this is uh, now listed in the National Register so um, integrity uh, in most cases transportation properties are the except are, are functional rather than ornamental, the exceptions being the depots. And uh, depots are, and there are plenty of depots that are more functional than ornamental, I think. And, and, and if you go through, I just was scanning through the, the depots that you, you go to the National uh, Register site and just put in Depot California and you get all these depots. There's, there's, I would say that some huge proportion of all standing depots in the state of California have been listed in the National Register. Most of them are uh, Southern Pacific standard types, you know, that, that border on being uh, cookie, cookie cutter buildings that were huge in number at one time. They're, they're unusual now in the sense that there's not that many of them left and people just, there's a lot of interest in them. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you about um, with most with, with transportation features. The it's the presence of character defining features that that uh, will define their integrity. And you need to need to say what what is it what that defines the character of of a particular transportation feature. And and if it's if it's a trust bridge, if it's the the elements of the trusts. If it's a mace, if it's a scenic highway, the uh, this unfortunately this oh, I thought of it getting a picture of uh, stone uh, stone masonry railings along. This is Highway 70 going over the Feather River, which I think is one of the most interesting historic highways in the state. Uh, it, it it is their functionality in many many cases that defines. The, their character, that's, is their character defining feature. Does that seem reasonable to you? I'm sorry. Yeah. 
Oh yeah, well, but that's part of their functionality, though. You know, that if it if. Oh, I think it is. I think it is. I'm I'm saying. I I guess what I'm saying. Man, I'm not saying it very well. That that it is their functionality that is their character defining features. It, you can you can go across the board from railroad related resources to highway related resources to uh, transit. Although my experience in dealing with transit is is uh, more limited than. The, the author of the of the trolley trolleys of San Diego. I'm going to give you another kind of uh, unusual example of how functionality defines uh, character. This, in the in the 1850s and 1860s, I, I oh it, the the magazine California History that's put out by the California Historical Society. Their current edition has a has a article by moi dealing with the suspension bridges of A.S. Halliday, who is otherwise known principally as, as inventing the cable car system in San Francisco. But before he did that, he was really a manufacturer of wire rope and was looking for ways to use it. Suspension bridges were a real nice way to use them. Uh, he also invented the aerial tramways, which are really basically ski, ski uh, lifts. And again, a use of uh, of wire rope, and really the cable car was just the aerial tramway turned upside down with the cable underneath, just that endless loop of of wire rope. Anyway, in in the 1850s and 1860s, when there were still a lot of people living in little towns like Bidwell Bar and Rattlesnake Bar, and these towns that, that no longer exist, a whole bunch of suspension bridges were built, and they were perfect because the, the rivers were not dammed, and the, and the rivers flooded ferociously, and timber trestle bridges just wiped out one, every year. So there were a whole bunch of these were, that were built, and, the, and there were dozens and dozens of them. And in, until the 1960s, there were only two that were left. This one is Bidwell Bar, uh, which was threatened by Lake Oroville. And the second one was Rattlesnake Bar, which was threatened by Folsom Lake. And uh, so both of them would have had to have been moved in order to be saved. What happened with Rattlesnake Bar, which was a Halliday Bridge, this one is not a Halliday Bridge. This one was imported from somewhere in New York, but um, imported the, the, the metal towers and the cables were all imported from, from New York. So the, somebody drove a overloaded truck across Rattlesnake Bar and the bridge broke and fell, in, fell into, the, into uh, the river. Took just before the Bureau of Reclamation was gonna have to do something about it. This is all, this, this is all prior to uh, the National Historic Preservation Act, just a little bit before that. But this one, state parks, um, decided that they would save this bridge they, and they were going to move it to another location. And I would say that if it had been moved and, and, and built, rebuilt properly, would probably still be eligible for the National Register because, it, because of the rarity of it. I mean, it was, this is the last of the Mohegans. This is the only one that is left from that whole generation of suspension bridges. So, in 1964, I think it was, just as the water was rising up at Oroville, State Park took this down, stored it for a few years, and then rebuilt it. Uh, probably not more than a mile from, probably more, not more than a half a mile from its original location. But we're talking about character-defining features. What is character, characteristic of a suspension bridge? It's suspended, right? It has it, the cables carry the carry the bridge, and I know we're in a in a uh, facility owned by state parks, and I worked for many years with state parks, and I have a lot of respect for them. This was not their finest hour when when they rebuilt the bridge. They made it into a trestle, a trestle with. Uh, cables attached to it. <laughs> anyway it, it, the character defining fee, I, I don't think i don't think has ever been tested whether this would be eligible for the national register but 
I wouldn't vote in favor of it, despite its incredible rarity. I mean, the, 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 it, it does, in fact, have those original, oops, sorry, sorry about that. It does, in fact, have those original metal towers, which were manufactured in New York, in Schenectady, in New York, and shipped around the Horn. And it does, in fact, have the original cables. No, no, it, it's not a suspension bridge. It's a trestle. It's a trestle with an ornamental <laughs> cable attached to it. I don't, you know, I actually was interested in this, and I, I went over to read the correspondence, because I, I, I was contemplating writing an article about this, but I wanted to know what, what they did, and, it, and I, I decided not to go forward with it because it was too embarrassing. It, well, there's no question, but it was a matter of cost that this was the cheapest way that they could get the bridge more or less re-erected. Because there was a lot of uh, uh, hue and cry amongst the people. The people love this old bridge, you know, it, it, it's darn shame. Another criterion other than A and C that is occasionally used is criterion P, which, which stands for public controversy. <laughs> And, 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 and I think what, you know, really when, when you have, when criterion P comes into play, there's all the other rules are out the window. I, I think that it, this particular one is, is a little trestle in San Jose area. And um, it was the, the people who, who wanted to preserve it uh, sought to have it, um, listed as a city landmark, the city refused to do it. They sought to have it listed in the National Register and the keeper of the National Register refused to list it. But then it was, um, they put it forward as a um, California Register and, and it is in fact listed in the California Register today. The, the, the I guess what I would say, almost every conclusion I've mentioned it to this point doesn't apply to this particular bridge because it, it just it it takes on a life of its own when it went in time of public controversy so assessing effect uh, just as character defining features def help define the significance of a transportation feature so too do character defining features help define the effect of a property of a project on and with this sort of ridiculous uh, story here but it, i mean it, it really was done it really it really did happen i'm not making this story up uh and you really can go see this if you want to see, if you want to go see this at the uh what's it called it's a a marina a marina where they rent um houseboats at lake oroville anyway uh the fact that it took away so much from the character defining features of the bridge that it, it's hard to think that it wouldn't be regarded as an adverse effect if it, if it had gone through uh, section 106. I don't really know what, whether that it even, I don't know, I don't believe this, this was ever evaluated for, for those who are really in the know. Public Resources Code 502.5024.5 dealing with state-owned properties effect of a state project. I don't think this ever went through there, even though this, uh, don't know, don't know the, I, I don't want it, what's that? Well, the, 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 recon, the deconstruction was in 1964, and the reconstruction was 1976, I think. So there was no pu public resource code, never mind. Never mind. Yep, you're right. It would, this, would, this one just kind of uh, flew under the radar, as they say. Anyway, but the, you, you get the general point, that, that, that just as character-defining features help define significance, so they also help to define effect. And here we are back with the I Street Bridge again. Um, the, the, the two cities, the, this... Uh, we're right, we're right there. Uh, 
the two cities, uh, this Sacramento and West Sacramento, their proposal is to leave this bridge in place as a railroad bridge. It's a, it, it's a perfectly usable railroad bridge and is extraordinarily important uh, from a transportation standpoint. But to take away the approaches on both sides and then build a new bridge somewhere about here where the, where the uh, traffic will, will, the vehicular traffic will be separated. So the, the question is, does removing, now the original bridge, the 1904, I think it is, to 1902, 1904, it ends right there. And then there's exactly the same point on the, on the West Sac side. The rest of this stuff, this, is, this one I think is from the 50s and one is from the even later. Uh, does removing that and that constitute an adverse effect to the bridge? Yeah, it always has been. I mean, you know, you, there are pictures of it from with with wagons going across this thing in, in 1900 pre automobile. I mean, they, it had there has been some use, but there was just 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 a straight ramp that went straight down on both sides. It was it was in. So my contention is that there the significance of this under criterion A relates entirely to the railroad not and to and to the the um, navigational use of it not to the highway use. it it is today a really a pretty insignificant highway bridge it's not it doesn't carry a whole lot of traffic doesn't really connect up you know the cities and the, the way that the tower bridge a little further over has always been an extraordinarily important vehicular bridge so my intention was that everything that is significant about it from under a or c will still be there when you take the approaches off it. That, that's my opinion. And I think uh, that's winding its way, uh, 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 finding effect is winding its way through the cities and through the Caltrans and I, I don't, I, that, that, is, that is officially my position on that and we'll see. Um, now what we're gonna do, and I think oh, this is gonna work out just perfectly. Um, I have to apologize to Chad because you saw much of this already uh, in, at, uh, in Pasadena presentation uh, with Diane Kane. But it was uh, the question of uh, applying this. I was asked to discuss uh, also, uh, can you apply the Secretary of Interior standards to transportation features? There's no reason why you couldn't. I mean, those standards are meant to apply to to everything from a home to an office building to uh, to uh, uh, even conceivably a a boat or or a, a, a locomotive, it's difficult. I mean, it, it's tricky to, to apply the standards, but it, it it can become really important if you are one of the ways of avoiding an adverse effect is to make the case that a project uh, meets the Secretary of Interior standards. And so that, that's what I'm going to talk about now is how to, how to apply these, these, these standards to uh, transportation features. And I guess my, my short answer would be very carefully or, or uh, very studiously. Uh, and I'm just going to go through the, 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 the 10 um, standards. Uh, used, used for its, uh, keeping its original use. Um, so I would say that if you keep a vehicular bridge in, and, oh, and this, is, this is all specific to bridges, but you can use some imagination to make it apply to other uh, highway related or other transportation related features. It's happened to be, I, when I put these together, I was dealing only with bridges. Which is some, it, it, you may have guessed, is a subject of some interest to me. Uh, how about putting a vehicular bridge in, into 
non-vehicular use, pedestrian uh, or equestrian even conceivably. Uh, this was, this was a, a uh, when, when I was uh, uh, working for Caltrans, this, this, this was probably the most controversial uh, project that I was ever involved with. And, and I, in many ways, I, 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 I regret the way it turned out. We had just finished the first Caltrans bridge inventory, and we felt like it was necessary. We had just finished it, and we, and we had found that this bridge wasn't eligible for the register. I, 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 would, I, would, I would go back on that today, and, 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 but that's the way it was. We, we, when you compared it to all of the br same bridges of the same type, it was, it was, it was uh, found to be you know, less, less interesting than some of the others. And, and um, quick story, uh, there was a guy, who wrote for uh, a magazine that doesn't exist anymore. I can't remember even what the name of the magazine was, but lived in Guerneville and was reported in his magazine a, um, that I had made a presentation regarding this bridge. And it, he didn't name me by name, but I was the only guy who had spoken, so I knew it had to be me. And he referred to it as this asshole engineer from, from Caltrans. So we had we had a staff meeting, and my boss said, oh, "An interesting article here, where Michael is referred to as, as an asshole engineer." I said, "Oh man, did they call me an engineer?" <laughs> anyway, um, this has been taken out of service, and and is is, is you. The only thing I would say is, is, that didn't work out. If you ever go to Guerneville, you should you should the, this. Photograph is taken from where the new bridge is. So the old bridge has its own character. Oftentimes, these are they're, they're, when they're right next to each other, it, it, the setting gets lost. And but this this is a gorgeous a solution. But if you go there, eh, the poor thing is not being maintained the way it should be. And I think that if we it, it, and there isn't any way to really write that into the Section 106 uh, agreement that the county has to forever maintain the bridge. It's, it, the citizens of the county need to get on the county to take better care of it. But this is a perfectly good solution. And, and this is another one in Tuolumne, little town of Jamestown in Tuolumne County. It's a, it's a little one lane bridge that has been listed in the register for a long time because it's it's really old reinforced concrete bridge. I've forgotten exactly when it's like 1902 or 1904. Uh, the the county intends to, uh, the, the new bridge is, is even further away than was the case in Guerneville. The, the new bridge is going to be probably half a mile away. They're, they're dealing with some other uh, connectivity issues by moving the highway. So, but th this is a, a connects up with a popular equestrian trail, so they, they, it will be kept in place. And ironically, the only kind of nasty thing that has to be done, it came up with what you were talking about, the, the, the acceptable pedestrian railings. These concrete railings are about six inches too short to be code, and so they're going to put a uh, metal barrier inside of it, which is is not ideal, but it, it's if 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 they're in fact are going to invite pedestrians to use the uh, use the bridge, I, I think it probably has to be done. It's not. It, I wish it didn't have to be done, but I think it does. Um, historic character of a property should be retained. The removal of historic uh, materials. Or alterations of features that, uh, and spaces that characterize property should be avoided. Um, and I'm asking a question um, again. My earlier contention that that character defining features are things that make make a bridge uh, a bridge work, or any transportation features here. Th this is a project that uh, I think was really quite successful. It was um, a was and is a major bridge in the town of Healdsburg. And it's, it, it's in, insufficient in every conceivable category. I mean, it, it, uh, it was, had some structural issues, way too narrow to, to really handle two lanes of traffic and substandard. 
handle to. But the community wanted to keep it. And also what, what they found too was that this pier is in the middle of the Russian River, which is one of the you know major flood flooding rivers in, in uh, California. And the scour on that pier had, was spectacular. And it was basically uh, held in place by some redwood pieces of redwood. Um, so there were, they, they, there were some changes that had to be made, uh, the biggest of which was to, the, the, the original pier was left in place, but it was kind of like your, your um, shot creek walls, that it was, it was a new, new uh, piece of concrete was poured around the original pier. But it's, it, 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 it's, it has the same geometry, it has the same shape of the original, and also uh, these, this is the original railing. It always had uh, sidewalks, a cantilevered sidewalks. And this was the original railing, which is, is too short for modern standards. But also, the kids were jumping into the river and breaking their neck, I guess. It, it's a common. It, I mean, some, some months of the year is fine. Other months is not fine. And, and so they put this, the, the original was left in place, but this, this, um, pretty imposing looking little <laughs> concertina wire. Um, anyway, the, do either of those affect the character defining features of, of the bridge? And, it's, and, and I think the only one that, that comes closest to it is the pier because the pier is obviously an important functional part of, part of the bridge. It also, if anything happens to it, there's no bridge. So, um, a little bit here. Uh, each property must be recognized as a physical record uh, time use uh, changes that create a false sense of historical development such as adding conjectural features or architectural elements from other buildings should should be avoided in this case um, the city just wanted to do this uh, these approaches had uh, concrete elements had been missing for 50 years and they, they they rebuilt them when when they were came in, but it was it was taken from the plans and it was taken from the original plans which existed and it was taken from. So I don't really regard this as a conjectural. It's it's a kind of restoring something that had been missing, and is a a nice element to them. So this one, does anyone know what this one is? It's what? Yeah. So I mean, this I don't think that this bridge is eligible for the register. I mean, it may be, maybe it should be, but I don't think it, it has been determined eligible. But this stuff is a National Historic Landmark. So <laughs> this is a crazy thing. Isn't it? That it, this is something that I'm sure that the people who designed the Coronado Bridge never intended to have this, this occur and to have a National Historic Landmark piece of art on it. It's just kind of an odd duck situation i i certainly don't think well number one would be the stupidest thing calvin could possibly do and i don't think they should be involved in the business of removing this artwork but but it 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 it, it was not meant to be part of this bridge i guess is what i'm saying and then uh preserving uh distinctive uh features. This is, this is a really odd situation in, in Los Angeles, the first, first street bridge that was widened. And I'll show you a picture a little later, the degree to which it was widened. It was more than twice, it was widened more than twice its original width. But while they were doing it, they did save these portals along the way and managed to put them back on the bridge. I mean, it's still an adverse effect, I think, but... Uh, Deteriorated uh, should be should be repaired rather than replaced. Um, new featured match match the original. Blah blah. Substantiated by well, I I guess my point was that the, the, I think this one met met that particularly with with the concrete railing over here and and they did it as well as they could with the center pier. I mean I think it, I think it worked pretty well. Um, 
there we go. Same point. Chemical sandblasting and so forth. The, the defective bridges, and I think this goes to most transportation features, uh, with rare exceptions, and they, there are going to be exceptions to this. So railroad trestles and and timber bridges are, are certainly going to be the exception, and and railroad depots are going to be the exception. But for the most part, bridges in particular are, are most of them are made out of metal or concrete, which are which are particularly uh, immune to this this type of cleaning. Uh, Archaeology. I, 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 I say. I say none. Um, I, there may have been a few cases, but the, the incidence of archaeological site, prehistoric archaeological sites showing up at bridge crossings is is so so common that I, I'm of the mind that the Indians knew just as well as the engineers where the good place was to <laughs> to cross the river. So they ended up anyway. Uh, this one is, is really a, um, to, to have a differentiation where, where, it, is, where it is quite obvious. It, it, I, and I took most of these pictures out, but I, when I originally made this presentation, I, I showed a bunch of the, the bridges in Los Angeles where they, they've been widening these National Register bridges uh, very commonly down there. And in some cases, they, as with the First Street Bridge, they attempted to mimic the original design. Other cases, they came in with, with uh, sort of wildly modern additions to it, which, you know, it shows that you, you, you could remove it, but it just doesn't work from my standpoint. From my standpoint, it really looks awkward. It looks like a poor bridge that got uh, something appended to it that just didn't work. Um, yeah, here, this is the first, you can see the, the, the width, uh, how much they, how much they widen it. So, and then my final point is, uh, new additions, uh, should be undertaken in such a manner that if removed in the future, the essential form and integrity of the historic property will be unimpaired. I don't think, particularly with widening a bridge, that the chances of ever taking it back to its original width is so slim that it's kind of an irrelevant point. Uh, I, I think you could, um, there, may be, there may be some, and certainly we saw some cases of the, 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 the cube inside the depot was, was an excellent point. I'm just saying for, for the depots are really kind of an exception when you're talking about transportation features. They're, they're, they're just, they're really more like an office building or, or more like, uh, they, they, they have more in common with office buildings than they do with bridges. So, um, and here's, here's closing. Do you have any questions? And then second, do I have any answers? Any questions from the room? Yeah, I had one about the issue of um, abandoning the automobile use, uh, and you gave some, you showed some great examples of either pedestrian or bike or um, horse, horseback. I wonder if you, if you're not prohibiting automobiles <laughs> from using the bridge, you're just saying for the time being, no automobiles are going to cross the bridge, and instead oh, oh, we're no, going no. In, to. In those it. cases, they, they, it, 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 that bridge has to be taken out of vehicular use. It has to be decommissioned as a bridge from the the the, the federal list and the Caltrans list of bridges. So they no, you you can't you, once those once the heel once the, the it's a regulatory the, yeah prohibition. once the Guerneville Bridge was taken out of it, you cannot take a vehicle vehicle on it. And it has bollards in front of it. That so that is permanent. I got it. Okay. Interesting. Another question? <laughs> yeah, I was uh, wondering if you knew the uh, roughly the percentage of bridges that was um, saved after the advent of the auto automobile. I know that probably in the 50s and 60s, the concern was a little less pronounced than it is now. 
but do you have any idea? You know, I think I, I think it's. I'm showing my age. I'm. I, I did, John, did you get did you get the gist of that of that question? Oh, no. or maybe I'll just I, I, rephrase I, I it. <laughs> um, so, what do you think the percentages of the historic bridges that were built around you know from the late 1800s, turn of the century, into before the automobile came to uh, dominate um, transportation? So. The, they're very rare, very rare. It, it, the, the beauty of the Caltrans bridge inventory is that you can really manipulate um, data, you know, because you have, what you have is uh, n n not for the non-eligible bridges, but you can look at the eligible bridge, of which there's 300 or something like that. I can't remember the exact number, but it's, it's, it's a fairly large number. And of the, the ones that were, if you, if you think automobiles sort of came into use about, after the 1906 earthquake, you know, some, sometime after that. And the, the pre-1906 bridges, like that one in Rawhide, the one I showed you, that, that, is a, that, is, that is a bridge that didn't carry cars when it was built. It was built to carry. But those, I bet you the number of, of, that are listed is less than 20, really. It's, it's a very small number. A question from me, actually. Um, so, is it conceivable to receive a tax credit for a transportation um, property like a bridge or a trestle or maybe a plat train platform, for example? Well, I, 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 not if the bridge was, I mean, the bridges, operational vehicular bridges are by definition publicly owned. But it certainly, I could see tax credits being applied to some depots if the depot were, were restored and, and put into a commercial use. I don't think any, I can't. Um, yeah, yeah or, or, or I suppose. Well, I guess the reason I was asking that is I'm thinking of the 16th Street station in, um, oh. in Oakland. Yeah. And they have a platform on the backside of the station, and I'm, I'm not sure what they're planning on doing it with it, but say they had to put some funds into repairing or replacing certain components of that platform, could they use some tra tax credit funds for something like that? Yeah, well, that would, that would again, be a uh, depot-related uh, uh, case. And I, I, I could see those working. I, I, that would be, you know, there might be other little railroad uh, related station houses and things like that. I could see there's some other buildings, buildings as opposed to structures that, 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 would, that would work for. Okay. I mean, I guess it's like I was saying with the criteria, you can come up with, with examples of how it could be done, but in fact, it never has been done, you know, for whatever reason, it's never been done. I think just in response to your question, it would depend on who the owner is, because if it is a publicly owned resource, then they can't apply for tax credits because it would be a credit to themselves, basically. Yeah, yeah exactly. So it would have, if it were um, a, a privately owned depot or um, any other, I mean, even a privately owned bridge that was moved and relocated to a private yeah. property, they probably could. But it would have to be... A, a, a income producing use of it too. That's, that's what I was going to ask as well. It has to be income producing. Yeah. So would, would uh, traffic traveling over it can be, con that wouldn't be considered income. Pro you would yeah, have to well, charge yeah, a no, toll, I guess. The Bidwell Bar Bridge, the 1857, it was built ex explicitly for the purpose of charging people to go across it. Uh, it was a toll bridge. Okay. Um, let me check if there are any questions online here. I don't see any, oh wait, there might be one. No, there's two. Um, so uh, for a highly detailed bridge with a balustrade below standard, would it be appropriate to install, this is a longer question, so I might have to say it again, but for a highly detailed bridge with a balustrade below standard, would it be appropriate to install a code compliant tension wire balustrade inside the historic non-compliant one? And there's a second part to this question. Okay. So do you want to yes is the answer to the first one. Okay. And while distinctive enough to not be confused with the original character of the structure, would such a structure not be too intrusive 
for the appearance of the original structure. Yes, uh, that's, that's what I was saying with that rawhide bridge. What they're, they're putting is a metal baluster, you know, that it is the correct height. What, what is the inches? It wants to be 44 for... Okay. Uh, second question is, do you know what kind of issues were involved in the decision to demolish rather than restore the Seventh Street Bridge in Modesto, also known as the Lion Bridge? Uh, no, I, I, I don't. I, I don't. It was. I mean, I think. I think it was. Uh, they have a rating system. It, it's called a sufficiency rating, but it's really an insufficiency rating, where where you can have a score between one and one hundred, and if it's anywhere near fifty, it applies for it, it eligible for placement funding. And that poor bridge had like a two, I believe. And it was one of the only usable bridges in this, or use, bridges in use that had a rating that low. I don't know whether it could ever have been repaired rather than replaced. I, I really don't know. I didn't work on a project. I'm, my guess is that uh, the city of Modesto or uh, Stanislaus County came to the conclusion they couldn't. I don't know. I just don't know the answer. Okay, <laughs> hand you the mic here. Um, yeah, so with the with that Seventh Street Bridge in Modesto, um, the city did determine that it was unfeasible to restore it, um, and made the CEQA determination of a statement of overriding considerations for a preferred alternative of replacement. But for their 106 purposes, which is something Susan and I will be explaining kind of the differences of later, um, they did have to analyze all the alternatives um, and did and it got very far along in the process actually drafting their agreement document, in including both alternatives. Um, but then eventually the city made the decision um, again, a statement of overriding consideration, acknowledging the adverse effect of the replacement, um, basically because it is a concrete arch bridge saying that seismic retrofit was infeasible due to the, the deterioration of the, of the materials. Great. Um, no further questions from online. So are there any others for the room? Oh, one more. Just one back to my alignment and location. Uh, character defining feature issue. You mentioned that the placement of many of the bridges also relates to where crossings were historically and prehistorically. And I'm looking, I'm thinking relative to like the tower bridge here, its placement, if you move that bridge, it, it part of its eligibility would be gone. Yeah because its placement is part of its significance. And I think maybe we, a lot of that needs to be factored in and considered too, not just, it, not just the trusses or whatever. Yeah. Yes. 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 And it's, and, and it's, if it's not, if it's significant for its architecture, only then moving it is fine and similarly like a bridge if there's nothing about its location its siting then moving it would be good but yeah. i just don't want that to be missed if it is significant for its siting well and i and i i do think that again i think that's mine i, I apologize <laughs> uh, in fact a bridge the size of the tower bridge, as far as I know, has never never been moved. It's it, it, it's just too big to to, to deal with. Uh, but the little little truss little trusses <laughs> elsewhere in the United States, little trusses have been moved all the time. In California, it just doesn't happen here, and I I, I really don't don't know why. I, there's got to be some uses for those little bridges. They, I mean, they're they're so small they can be picked up with a uh, and moved by truck, you know. But uh, it just hasn't happened. But I do think, though, that uh, it, on your same point, well, that little bitty Calaveritas bridge I showed you there, that, that was, to the people who live there, that's the bridge that has always defined 
that city. And if you picked up that move, that bridge and moved it somewhere else, it would be a terrible, it might be okay wherever it's going, but it'd be a terrible loss to the people who live there. It, not, not so much because of exactly where it was, you know, but because, well, it is exactly where it was. It, it's the heart of that city.